Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to the latest uh, Independent Gyms webinar series. I've no idea which number this is, uh, but thanks for jumping in. Um, Ashbourne Management are becoming a bit of a, a regular host of these sessions for us. So thank you to, to Toby, who's stepping in for this one. Um, Gabe, good to see you again. I haven't seen you for a while. Welcome back. Hi, mate. You're um, <laughs> yeah, I sort of recognise your name pop up and I say, yeah, it's a blast from the past. You've been a bit quiet lately. So uh, yeah, welcome. <laughs> Hopefully we can help you with this. Um, yes, yeah, cool. so this one is essentially about diversifying your model, secondary spend, all that kind of jazz. I won't do too much of an introduction because I'm going to leave Toby to do that. But um, yeah, Toby's obviously at Ashford and also Fit Club Relic. She was used, uh, he's got an operator's experience and supplies experience. So hopefully this is going to be a useful session. So on that note, Toby, over to you. Thanks very much, Rob. Cheers, mate. Hello, everyone. Um, as I said, I'm Toby. And Rob, do you mind um, muting your mic there, mate? Just got quite a yeah. lot of background noise. Uh, maybe it's not you. Uh, Two seconds. Well, we'll just go ahead anyway. I think we're all good. Okay. So yeah, my name's Toby, and as Rob uh, said there, I am going to talk to you today about um, diversifying your secondary spend model. Se uh, secondary spend model at your gym. Um, I work for Ashbourne Management, and the, uh, the Pit Club Redditch is my gym. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that and how that relationship works. Um, to start with. So yeah, there I am in uh, my first experience of modelling. Um, so through Ashbourne Management, we um, we manage payment collections, we provide management software, um, access control, and in more recent times, we've also branched out into, into consultancy um, via the Fit Club Redditch and also with our uh, marketing department, which has grown a lot. And some of you guys might have um, seen the talks that Harvey's done um, from Ashbourne, and he he's kind of heads up that side. Um, so yeah, you've, you've probably heard of us and um, we're a little bit different from other suppliers in that we look after everything from payment collections to software um, rather than just doing one or the other. And what that does mean is that we can have a really, really good um, access control solution. So everything's integrated, works in real time. Um, and also the fact that we handle it all in-house means that you just get the best possible service. So that's a little bit about us. Bit Club Redditch, um, it's something that we, a project that we took on. Uh, myself and Grant from Ashbourne, alongside Ashbourne, from uh, back in 2019, in November 2019, which was obviously fantastic timing with the pandemic. But what it has meant is that we've learned a massive amount about what our customers want, what actually works in gyms, um, and we're continuing to develop our project products using the Fit Club. So um, it's a large facility based in the West Midlands, and it's um, independently managed, despite having that um, at relationship with Ashbourne. So for today, we're going to be talking about secondary spend. So what do we mean by secondary spend? Anything from personal training to uh, tanning is what we're discussing today. Um, for the purpose of this, it's um, anything other than your standard income from memberships. I know for a lot of clubs, personal training is probably a bigger revenue generator than uh, the memberships themselves. But for the purpose of today, we're going to discuss a, a few ideas. But how you might diversify that and uh, maybe change the models that you, you've already got with your personal training. So I'll try and keep it uh, concise. I'm going to give you as many kind of high level ideas without going into too much detail so that you might take something away from the call. If you then have more questions, just get in touch with us. My email will be at the end and um, or you can just drop in the comments. Um, and yeah, I do go into obviously with secondary spend there's a number of different suppliers i'm not going to mention the suppliers by name because i don't want to step on rob's toes um obviously he has his customers and whatnot um so if you do want to know the name of any suppliers just drop me a, a message after and i'll be happy to tell you just don't tell Rob. okay so yeah personal training obviously can be a hugely lucrative um part of your business like i say a lot of clubs have um, more income coming in from personal training than they do from their actual memberships um, for the purposes of today, I'm going to talk about three different models that um, seem like the most popular models of running a personal training business within your gym um, and also how you might manage those models. So no rent is the first one, a rent free um, personal training experience, which might, <laughs> might run, make some of your blood run cold, as I know a lot of people get um, classes paid for um, or just income from their personal training um, offering. Secondly, we'll be talking about invoice rent, which is the kind of classic example of PTs working off rent by doing classes or just simply you invoicing them. Um, and then third, I'm going to talk about um, the personal trainers being club employees. So that's something that you see in a lot of um, larger gym chains 
and if done properly can be hugely lucrative for for the gym so yeah to start with uh free rent which is actually this is um an idea that i was discussing with someone at the last independent gyms uh conference actually and he had just brought in um a method of uh well, just got rid of pt rent basically um and what he actually found by doing that was that he was able to attract the best PTs in the area, one of whom was a guy that had kind of 50 um, clients himself. Every single one came over to his gym and uh, and signed up. That's the, the caveat with this, is that although you're not charging any rent, you, um, although you're not charging any rent, you can, everyone that does come as a PT client needs to be a gym member. And so if you're getting the best PTs, then you're gonna get that membership coming into your gym. Um, uh, yeah, so it's, it's kind of a big picture idea, this one. It's one that um, if you want to really make yourself a performance center, if you want to really get ahead of your competition, um, then this is a great method for doing that. Um, you have the pick of local trainers uh, and probably those further afield. If people are paying 500 pound PT rent a month, they're going to be willing to travel for the opportunity to not have to pay that and you benefit. Um, attracting the best trainers will surely mean clients follow them to your facility, like I just said. Um, and Something that you could probably do with any of these packages, but even more so if you're doing something like offering free rent, is to demand a minimum client quota. So what I mean by that is um, personal training having at least 10 clients on the books per month. And I'll show you how you could track that in, in a second. But obviously that's good for you if they're bringing in those that minimum clients. You've got PTs that are working, a buzzing gym, and obviously you're getting that membership income. The, the main con to this is that you need to do your calculations before moving over to the method. I think that the guy that I was speaking to, who I won't mention, but he made it clear that he already had um, a connection with this personal trainer and the way he attracted him was saying, listen, I won't make you pay anything. And then he realized, actually, this is quite a good method um, all round. And lo and behold, all of his personal trainers now don't pay rent, but they do have a quota. Um, but yeah, you need to do those calculations and just confirm that it's actually going to be worthwhile for you to get rid of personal training rent and to move over to this free um, model. The next one is your classic uh, rent approach. So um, it's simply personal trainers pay you rent to use the facility. So in the um, in the kind of the classic model, a lot of personal trainers, especially when they're junior, junior will pay um, pay off rent using classes, possibly desk hours and things like that. I know that the rules have changed with this whereby you need to actually invoice the personal trainers um uh, or they need to invoice you for their classes and then you need to invoice them, them for rent but that's something you can um, look at with your with your accountant <laughs> i won't go too much into that um but yeah this is the classic method of um, hosting classes or just paying off rent um it's good because obviously you get that extra income from the gym um at no cost to yourselves pts will still bring in new members um, albeit you can't attract the same caliber as PT of PT necessarily as you can with the uh, the free approach, um, and then it's also a good access opportunity for per, uh, junior PTs if they don't have the client base to cover um, the rent. I think that this one's best adopted um, with kind of a hybrid model whereby personal trainers once they get to a certain level can just pay you the cash, or um, if you want to get junior personal trainers in, then they can do classes and you kind of have it as a bit of a, um, a fluid situation if you will um so yeah uh, the cons of this is not necessarily an attractive option if rent is expensive or trainers are reluctant to host classes um and it might be difficult to attract the best clients also as i've found in our um in our at the fit club is that pts are not necessarily the best receptionist so a lot of the time they're more focused on what's going on in the gym floor which isn't terrible because like, they're out there chatting to members that's good but i've also had instances where they're kind of programming on the desk and we've had to come down on that and actually we don't really um it, we've got rid of all the personal trainers that were working on the desk we don't offer that anymore we only allow um you to pay off using classes or the classic um just invoice them and, and receive the money which is obviously the preferred approach for us so the final option that I mentioned, uh, the final model, I should say, is um, that the trainers are employed by your business. So this is something that um, I know is popular in Virgin, Pure Gym, all of the big chains are doing this, um, where they're employed by the business. They um, None of the PT money goes to them. It all comes into the business and then they're paid a cut of, um, of how many clients they have. Um, at Virgin, 
you have three different models depending on your experience. So junior personal trainers will get one percentage, whereas a master trainer, which is the guy at the top who's been there for years or just came with experience, will get like a higher percentage. So there is still that um, opportunity to um, appeal to a different levels of PT with this. So it's quite flexible. Um, the, obviously, the drawbacks are they're still entitled to all the employment benefits that would come with um, uh, hiring anyone. It means it's not so easy to get rid of PTs when they're troublesome or you don't like what they're doing, um, which is obviously a huge, huge um, advantage of them running their own business in your gym. However, that security element can also be attractive and um, you might get a few PTs coming in because of that. Um, this, I think if you've got a massive income, um, sorry, a massive uh, demand for personal training, this is the best option because you don't have to worry so much about generating the leads for the trainer. So if you do this, you're going to have to supply a steady amount of leads to the personal trainer for it to, for the approach to really work. And I think that that's um, something to consider before switching over to it. Um, at the moment, uh, with the Fit Club as an example, because they're running their own business, a lot of the marketing falls to them. We obviously do hand leads to them, but it's on a round robin basis and it is largely down to them to promote ourselves. With this model, it's in your best interest, but you will need to do your, um, your fair share of promotion as well. Yes. And, uh, so, yeah, so talking briefly there about the, the uh, solution that we use at the Fit Club. Our system is something that we're testing. As I mentioned at the start of the call, um, a lot of things that we're doing at the Fit Club are, are products that are going to be moving on to Ashbourne customers soon. And um, and one example of that is the um, the system that we have for our personal trainers. So all of our personal trainers are set up on a direct debit system. They have their own dashboard, which you can see there. Um, and on the dashboard, they can see their live clients. They can contact their members um, and they can also sign them up to direct debit. So effectively, we can see at any given time how many clients the um, the PT is working with. We can see attrition rates, which is really important, especially if you were doing something like that, um, like that employed model that Virgin adopts. You want to be seeing that all these leads that you're handing to your personal trainers aren't just fluttering away and, you know, getting... Um, just basically uh, not retained. And that's crucial because I think the sign of a, uh, a great PT is their ability to retain members. And um, that's something that we're tracking with this, uh, with this system. Um, if your PTs aren't already collecting their memberships by direct debit or their, their client fees by direct debit, then that's something that I also really think you should consider because that's any PT that I speak to, that's always the bone of contention, having to chase money and things like this. And with a direct debit system, um, you obviously don't have to worry about that anymore and you'll obviously get the benefits of all this uh, tracking information and and just having a look at their performance as well um i just mentioned there as well that we do um promote them as well as part of our, our rent so that includes a kind of social media posts emails and um and that's all included in the rent payment so it's, when attracting new pts we've got a, a bit of a package to to put to them so i think that's uh, something that's worth considering so yeah, moving swiftly on to food and drink. So food and drink is something that I imagine everyone on this call, everyone in the group is doing in some context, um, whether it's selling bottles of water or, you know, you've got a full on cafe. Um, it's it's well versed and it's something that's talked about a lot. I know that uh, water is a bone of contention that's recently come off of the group. I saw that post a few weeks ago, people wondering whether it was okay to to um, not offer free water to clients. And, and I think that it doesn't have to be one or the other. I know that some people are worried about offering water and um, kind of undercutting their own sales of bottled water. But in my experience, we've got a water fountain that's actually right next to where we sell water and we sell bottled water and we still sell a hell of a lot of water. It's a convenience thing. Um, and I think that's crucial. And I'll be talking about that a little bit in a second. Um, but yeah, for, for the purpose of this talk, I'm not going to go into too much into what products we actually sell, but rather talk about the processes um, and the ideas for maybe improving what you're doing. So stock control. We manage this using our Ashbourne till system, and um, there's a few features there that I think are really important. The main one and something that when we first moved into the gym was like a just an absolute nightmare and something that old owners hadn't really thought about was stock control um it, sorry was the um like stock going missing so stock control in that they had no idea 
you know, the difference between what they bought in during the day, what was in the stock room and things like that. So you need a system for managing that. And that's where the Ashbourne till system comes in. At the end of each day, the member of staff, when they close the till, they cash up, they uh, check that the, ca the draw matches the system. Um, and then we have a spreadsheet kind of which um, they fill in the details for each day. And then from a management point of view, we can look at that spreadsheet and, um, and uh, yeah, look at what we're selling for the month, look at where we're doing well, where we're not doing well, and also make sure that there's nothing going missing. Um, so yeah, I can actually send you that as well if you'd, if you'd like, but just again, just ask. Um, so yeah, and then, so yeah, we clamped down on staff not putting through products because um, I realized that that was the issue that we were having. So it wasn't actually people taking stock or stealing it in any way. It was that they would put through a transaction on the card machine and then they wouldn't put it through the till. So that basically created a black hole um, with our till system. Once we alleviated that, we can now see this is what we've taken on the card machine. This is what we've taken in cash. This is what we've sold across all the different product groups. And then this is what we're cashing, uh, cashing out for the day. Um, and, I, and it just works. It's a, it's a good system and it's, and it's bulletproof. So, um, yes. And then one thing that is coming um, with the next update at Ashbourne as well is uh, till alerts. So with the higher value stuff that we sell, um, tubs of protein, pre-workout, things like that, merchandise, I don't particularly like holding massive amounts of stock. It's costly. Um, it sits for a long time and there's more of a chance of it going out of date. Um, obviously, you know what works best for you, but Till Alerts is something that the new software system has, um, which just simply gives us a pop-up when we're running low on an item. You can set it to the level you want to. So with protein tubs, I have it set to two. We have um, one on the shelf, one in the stock room, and then as that one sells, you move the next one out, and then the next one's on the way. It's like a constant cycle for all the different flavors. And then... You don't have to take orders and things like that. So yeah, that's a little bit about stock control. Again, this is all very high level stuff in terms of the detail. So if you want a, any more information, just get in touch with us and we'll be happy to give it you. The next, um, the next area that you might have kind of looked at yourself is vending. So this is worth considering if you are a club that doesn't necessarily have someone on their desk at all times to, to sell drinks um, or, or, you know, make food or whatever. So, um, 24 hour clubs, vending is extremely popular with. I know that Rob's just had a partner on board for vending. Um, and as I say, that's why I'm not mentioning the suppliers today. But, um, yeah, it's worth considering if you're a 24 hour club or if you have unmanned hours. So that's, this is kind of what we're doing. So we've just taken on a vending machine. And the reason being is just for those periods where we've only got one person on the desk. It's, it's busy in the gym. Um, and they're out there doing inductions or things like that. We don't want to have to rely on, on just them to any stuff like that till. Um, so we've ordered the, the machine, which I'll go into in a second. But yeah, you need to think about um, your own position and, and whether it will work for you. Um, similarly to uh, tanning and sunbeds, which I'll talk about later, getting a vending machine isn't particularly difficult in terms of cost outlay. Um, you can get them secondhand, you can get rentals, you can hire purchase or you can purchase. Um, the reason I say it's not very difficult to get hold of is because the higher purchase for vending machines is really really simple to go through the the asset for the vending machine company has like a great residual value so they're not too worried about your position of a business unless you're in a really rubbish situation then i think it'll be easy for you to get one um so that's worth considering um and again i can pass on the details for that if you're interested if you do go down this route it's worth thinking about location um, too often I go to gyms and they have a vending machine, but it's tucked away in the back corner or somewhere like that. And it's for, if you're a 24 hour gym, maybe that's okay because people will seek it out. There's no other options. But if you're a gym like us, where it's kind of a hybrid model where you've got the, the reception, um, selling drinks and also the vending machine, you want to make sure that it's a convenient thing. So in like a really prime location, ours is going by the front door. So people from the high street can see it. People coming and going can see it. And I think that's really, really important to consider. Um, might seem obvious but yeah i see it all the time um so yeah I, I, as i mentioned we just ordered one um and most modern vending machines come with something called a nyx system on them so it's just a card machine you've probably seen them bright yellow things that go on the front really really good piece of software that comes with the nyx machine is that you can actually see um what products are selling what products aren't selling using that uh, system itself so you have a dashboard you can access it from anywhere if you have multiple sites you can be looking at what's something across this side, what's something across that side. And um, really good for 24-hour gyms or if uh, space isn't at a premium, you can have an off 
website, Stockroom, where you download your uh, pick list, you know what stocks you've got to take down to the gym, you take it, you fill up the machine, um, and it's just a really slick system uh, for keeping it full at all times. Which brings me on to my final point about vending machines, just making sure they're full. Like it's so, so simple, but that is something I see all the time. It really annoys me. <laughs> you know, just a vending machine with one bottle of water and an out of date grenade bar in it. And it's just like, come on. But yeah, there you go. And then the final bit on um, food and drink is maintaining your margins. Again, such simple stuff, but often not done well. Um, so, one uh, asset of this is your additional cost when you're ordering stock. Um, I can mention this company because I know they're a partner of the gym, but uh, of the gym of independent gyms. But Muscle Finesse, when you order below a certain threshold, you get charged delivery. So if you're doing an order every day for like a box of grenade bars, you know, a, a box of protein shakes, and not getting above that threshold then you're getting charged constantly. It's just eating into your margins. And I think that's so, so important. It really annoys me because I know it seems like a small amount of money, but it's just unnecessary. Whereas what we've started doing now, so this is, a, again, a mistake that I, I saw we were doing in the Fit Club. What we started doing now is just a, a stock take every two weeks. Sorry, a stock take every week and then a, a, an order with uh, Muscle Finesse every two weeks. And that just means we're over that threshold. We're not cutting into our margins. In the same vein, um, we just started doing hot food with... Um, a popular brand of uh, of frozen meals and um and it's stuff like napkins cutlery cups all eat into margin so when you're pricing stuff that's worth considering as well and obviously that see that all the time people not taking into account when they're pricing their products look at the the order form for, for the products from muscle finesse and think it looks cheap but they haven't taken into account that and they're just losing 20 percent there so another one worth considering um, I don't know if you, any of you used to watch Voucher Hunters back in the day, you know, the show where Americans would go to the supermarket and they would manage to get huge, huge amounts of shopping and just rubbish, like for no money at all. And it's because they hadn't thought of, um, I guess he's obviously chuckling to himself there. He definitely used to watch it. Um, program. Great program. Yeah, it is a great program. Yeah, very satisfying. But don't, don't be that, don't be those supermarkets is, is what I just wanted to say. Discounts on discounts. Um, is something that can kind of bite you. At the Fit Club, we have um, uh, a tier of membership called Foundation Members, and they're people that supported us during the lockdown, um, either by continuing their membership or, or in other ways, and they get 20% off everything. What we don't want to be doing is when we come to flash sales on, on particular things to raise the popularity in them, or if we're having a clearance on merchandise, is allowing those members to then get 20% off on top of the discount because we're at a loss. And that's something, even when I'm doing a clearance, I'll never be at a loss. Um, so that's worth considering. Also, most obvious thing is just watching the uh, the use by date on things because <laughs> particularly one thing I've seen with um, with mixed mix shakes is that they can sit for a long time, especially if it's an unpopular popular flavor. And then you lose half the tub because they've gone out of date. Um, have to flog it or, or throw it away, even worse. And then that's just, you know, killed killed the um, the profit on that particular item, the margin, I should say. Next, merchandising. You can see a little bit of mixed up merchandising that we uh, that we did there didn't actually sell very well, as I'll, I'll go into. Um, so custom clothing merchandise can be hugely hugely popular for gyms. Um, and can often overshadow, similarly to personal training, the um, the income from the gym. I've seen one chain of gyms up north, um, and his stock room was bigger than the actual gym itself. It was it was ridiculous, and he started that off the back of the gym, and has now got a, a national um, clothing line, effectively, which he <laughs> takes priority. But it's it's just so close to show that if you get it right, it can be hugely hugely lucrative. Um, so one mistake that we made at the gym was um, we went for this bulk buy method. So we got three different methods here of um, of merchandising. We got the bulk buy, buying stock, pre-orders, and drop shipping, which I'll go into. So what we did was we picked a design we liked, which happens to be Nike Nike gear, really expensive, uh, but it seems cheap before you get the pricing. Uh, sorry, before you get the printing done. We bought a load of it, printed, ready to go didn't really think about whether the demand was there and we just got left with loads of this stuff and ended up having to do clearances 
Um, and a lot of it ended up just being uniform for the staff, which they were pleased with, but wasn't obviously good from a business decision. Um, so yeah, that the bulk buy is what worked for this gym up north, who clearly knew their market, had a great brand um, and the demand, and now they're buying huge amounts of stock at a really, really low price. So the margins are fantastic, but you've got to think whether the demand's there. And that's where it brings us nicely onto pre-orders. Pre-orders is good if you're if you're um, testing the market. So if you've not done merchandise before and are thinking about doing it, a pre-order system can be a great way of um, just checking that there's actually some interest there, and then also having some guaranteed orders before you um, before you jump into buying stock. Very simple. Um, I think we'll probably do this again if we do um, merchandise. To be honest with you, uh, set up a Google form. Um, just asking people, would they like a T-shirt? What size would they like? And then it just gives you a basis um, for ordering and you can um, make a bit more of an informed decision. When the stock arrives, you can reach out to that person and, and tell them it's arrived. It's a bit labor heavy, but again, it's, it's as much about testing your market as it is about uh, making a profit with that one. Um, it does need to be a slick process. You need to think it through before because you don't want to have a massive gap between when you took the pre-order and when you actually get the, um, the stock in. Because unless you've taken a deposit, there's a good chance they're not going to, um, well, they just get ignored or they just won't want to take it up anymore. The final um, the final system I've seen for merchandising and is also one that we're looking at the Fit Club is drop shipping. So a lot of suppliers are out there who will actually set you up a website um, with a range of merchandise or with your own brand on it. it looks really, really smart and it's good quality stuff. Um, and then when a customer makes an order on your website, they'll literally just fulfill the order for you. So it's massively convenient, means you don't have to hold any stock and it's a good quality product. The drawback um, is that it's expensive. So for them, because it's good quality stuff, the product's expensive. Um, and then they obviously need to make their bit, which means it's expensive for your customer and it's expensive for the supplier. So the margins are very, very thin, but it gets your brand out there good quality stuff and yeah it's another option um i'd be interested to see what everyone's experiences are with merchandising because it seems like some people just get it so so right and then some don't i guess it's down to your brand as well though to be fair um so yeah final uh kind of area i'm going to talk about for for some questions and going back to rob is tanning so what have your thoughts on this tanning can be um a really really um a little bit off the off track for some gyms, but it can be a really, really lucrative um, uh, business within your business to set up. Um, and it doesn't necessarily come with the, the massive cost that people um, expect it to. So this is a little design that you can see the Tan Club is what we've called ours. We kind of set it up as its own business within within the gym. Um, it's um, the, the reason I say that it's pretty accessible is because it comes with these three um, options if you go to a tanning uh, bed supplier so a profit share option rental contract and purchasing the machine so at an entry level um at an entry level the profit share is a great option because it just means they'll put the bed into your gym and then you buy top up uh, cards from the supplier so basically as you grow your business your tanning business um, you buy more of the cards and um, there's no real risk for you. They won't ask for a cost. They just ask for um, the cost of the card, which works out at um, it's about 20, 20p a minute. I've got written here. So, yeah, 12 50 an hour. So that's worth looking at. You can charge, you know, as much as, you know, well, as much as you want, depending on your area. But at 20p a minute, it's not very difficult to see that, you know, it can be massively profitable. Um, a lot of people use sunbeds, which I was surprised at. We did some tests ourselves, had one bed. Now we have two beds because it is just so popular. People love tanning and uh, and the convenience thing is just huge because they're going to the gym anyway and, and they're there. So we actually charge a little bit more than the local competition just because of that convenience um, factor. So yeah, so if with the profit share, like I say, you buy the card after paying a small fee for the um, installation and then every time you run out, you just need to buy another card. Works out about 20p a minute. So if you want to do your own calculations, you, uh, you can do. With rental contracts, this, I'd say this is kind of the three points that are on like a sliding scale. You'd want to start with the profit share just while you test the waters with demand. Then move on to a rental contract. So that's, um, I got quoted £160 a month plus that for that. So, you know, it gets to a certain point where actually you'd be earning more if you just rented the machine, had unlimited minutes, which is how it works. 
um, and then can um, you know really grow the business and push on. And then obviously a full purchase, which is is costly, but they these machines require such little maintenance. It can um, it can be really really good. Um, so yeah, at the Fit Club we have um, an unlimited membership, which we collect by direct debit again. So people sign up, they get all the benefits of uh, direct debit, whereby you know there's a lot of passive income, people go on holiday, things like that, and we're still accruing money. Um, and for that, they get an unlimited tanning membership. That's the Tan Club. Um, again, we track it all using our system. Um, when someone comes in to use minutes, we note it down. And um, and yeah, it just works really well for um, for us with that. Um, one consideration: if you do want to get some beds, you need a three-phase supply. So there's a little uh, technical technical piece for you, Rob. That's pretty much all I've got um, in terms of that. I just, a few other de ideas um, that I just thought about earlier was like venue rental and and advertising your space within your gym. But I, I'd be interested to hear what other people have, or if you've got any questions. Yeah, mate, thanks for that. That's great. Um, I've made a few notes as always. <laughs> Go back to the PT side of it. Um, you're drawing on the screen there, so I'm not sure. Um, yeah, so the PT side of it, I think you mentioned about the no rent. I think one of the perks of that, I've got a friend in Redditch who's opened the gym and he's done that very same model, but he's done it as a way of getting a bit of a large back because they found that when they opened, they was in the gym all the time. So while it's not necessarily a secondary spend, and I think considering some of the members we've got who are those sort of low staff models, one or two people working, or they're always there, it just frees up their weekends. So their PTs are four or five, I think, will work, set shifts, no rent, work two shifts for free, all the money's theirs, but it means they don't have to work every weekend, every evening. Mm. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a good way to look at that. Um, one part of PT that you didn't mention, and I think it's probably the answer itself, is the um, just a straightforward split revenue where they'll pay per session, let's say it's £30 an hour, £10 to the gym, £20 in their pocket. What's your thoughts on that kind of thing? Well, that's, that's kind of what I'm getting out, um, getting out with the um, the employee model. I appreciate, are you, do you mean where they're um, actually still running their own business, but they just give you a cut? Yeah, that kind of thing. I think it's um, it's a bit of an old school way, isn't it? They'll bring someone in, they'll train them, and they go, oh, then you get 10 quid, they get 20 quid, that kind of thing. There's no structure there's no systems in place with it but it's quite an old school way of doing it i think some gyms will still work in that way so yeah actually with the system that we've um, developed with ashbourne we can do exactly that so i've stopped doing this because our pts have to put up with a lot because we're testing so many products ashbourne products so stuff does go wrong periodically um so it can go right for our, for our gyms i should say but um yeah so what we did at the start was we agreed that um for use of the system we'd get like a 15 percent commission and then that automatically went into our bank account while their pt income went into their bank account so that's actually a little bit more of a modern way of what you're talking about rather than doing like cash mm -hmm. in hand or anything like that and then everyone sorted for the tax and they've got all their statements ready to go um so yeah it's definitely something we can apply and i guess you'd get a lot of the same benefits that the you have with the club employee setup um mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, so I suppose that's an old way that's blending into the new model. I like the DD route for how you control it because what I find everybody, as much as we trust people, people still take the risks without maybe without knowing. And I think if you control all the money coming in, you're paying the PT with no sort of grey areas, there's no arguments with your staff other than they may be thinking they should have more money. So I think I really like that. Mm. the direct debit where you split the revenue and you take your chunk and they get theirs so I think that's, that's a right okay so I've just unmuted you what, how do you run your PT your club <laughs> right my connection's not great can you hear me yeah yeah we can we got it okay that's right I'm, I'm, I'm in Norway so it's up and down a little right. bit <laughs> my wife's driving while I'm doing this um, yeah. yeah I mean the, the, the PT situation for us I've never been very good at it to be honest I mean a lot of the things you spoke about in terms of merchandising secondary spends we're really red hot on and I make a lot of money out of merchandising but the PT I was interested about the non um, actual payment model because um, you know we've We've, we've never really had that many PTs um, last or even do well with us. Um, and, and the ones that have have kind of, you know, moved away and that was the end of it, really. Um, so I'm, I'm, I haven't really got anything to lose by trying to offer those free PT slots, you know. Um, 
some kind of like that's been really useful for me today to listen. So, you know, oh, thanks for that. Oh, good. I think it's, um, yeah, it's a really interesting model. And what, one problem that I've had with my PGs, similar to you, is that some of them seem to just take the mickey a little bit, but because they're paying this rent, they kind of feel a bit entitled. And yeah. with the with the rent-free model, you're providing a really, really good um, offer there and one that you can kind of lean on when people are giving you grief and, and try and make it a, a really good offering. So, yeah, I, I, I'm like you. We're really considering it as well. Um, and we'll, you know, see, we'll see what happens. When, when we've done um, these um, boot camps, right, which is maybe quite interesting in terms of secondary spend, and they've been incredibly lucrative for us. And what we've done is, is we've actually operated a separate boot camp from within the gym. So what we've done is, is we've signed up with a body scanner. Uh, we've got a body scanner um, in the gym and then they have the boot camp. And they do eight sessions, have a boot camp, have a free gym pass. And that basically not only has attracted other people in, but surprisingly, gym members have still paid to do this boot camp. Um, and what's worked really well is, is that that has actually increased our secondary spend value quite considerably. So that they've come in, they've bought more T-shirts, it's more personal. It, it's not, you know, anything, you know... Um, because we don't run classes you see so it's the first time there's been a class people are more chatty and it's pulled the community together but what it's done is by charging a separate um, boot camp fee it's actually increased our revenue by anything up to two thousand pounds a month you know wow nice that's yeah. a small, small group training that's something we'd like yeah. to look into as well i think it's yeah. um, and, everyone and, and that we, does it is like you know raves about it yeah, and, and the gym is £45 a month on its own anyway, um, or 35 depending. But we've had gym members still committing to paying £65 a month for that separate service, you know. It's run by a PT sometimes too. It's in a private area. Um, you know, we're now looking at making these even kind of more successful with opening up more space. So they're getting like a free T-shirt and, you know, it, you know, we're throwing quite a bit at it, you know, in terms of, you know, upselling it for one of a better word. So they'll get a free body scan at the beginning, free nutrition advice, but it's nothing that really costs us any money. You know, it's all there in terms of infrastructure and with the T-shirt supplies and stuff, we only pay six quid a pop for those. Um, mm. And they're, they're massively popular and we individualize them as well so that, if you're in that group, you get a individual T-shirt for that group, you know. Um, but as I say, you know, the PTs, you know, that has a huge secondary spend for us, you know, in terms of protein, asking advice about nutrition. So, um, and do you um do you carry much stock in stuff like um, you know big tubs of protein and, and <laughs> yeah, I do. I, do. I, I did. I did laugh when you said that because I hold any time up to about twelve grand's worth of stock. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. was, yeah, I'm, but, you can tell I'm, I'm at the start of my journey whereas you sound like you're pretty deep into it yeah <laughs> I mean we're, we're, re we're really big on stock and we do use muscle finesse they're very easy to work with but yeah. you know I, I think the thing that people tend to forget in this business guys is that there is always someone selling something somewhere and I think that it's very easy to go to Tropicana muscle finesse all these people but I think also there's a lot of stuff where people are, you know, bankrupt stock and, you know, uh, building up those kind of connections because the margins are crazy. I've had bars, you know, boxes of bars for seven quid instead of 14 or 15, you know, um, and that's when it starts right. to really increase your margin, you know. OK, yeah, yeah. So going for um, like different brands and things like that. Yeah, I just hunt around everybody, really, you know, so. Okay, so my question for you then, how many different brands of bars or whatever do you have in at a time? Because for me, it pains me when I go to a gym and I see they've got just a tiny selection and they could have so much more. Do you have a sort of a sweet spot in terms of how many different choices of bars yeah. or different brands? I mean, I have, I have two lines. I have one where I'm like just hunting for bargains, Rob, and then the other lines I have, which are regular ones. So... Oteen are very popular with us. Grenade used to be by the box, but nobody will buy them anymore because they're too expensive, especially in this current market. But people will buy them as individual bars, so we do still order those in. 
um, the Dorian Yates bars, even though the label's a little bit off-putting with fat off written on it, they're, they're, they're very popular. Um, so yeah, it's kind of so you got, open, open, you got you know. three main brands, I suppose, for the for the bar type stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. But, oh, yeah, Oteen are very good because they're very, um, you know, they're very, I don't know, cheap, really. Um, <laughs> you know, Obviously, and it, some of them, sort of some of, yeah, and some of their bars don't attract VAT as well. Um, so oh, you know that, good. yeah, that's really useful. You know, obviously, because there's a twenty percent margin automatically there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, um, so they're they're really good. But yeah, you know, as I say, we do tend to just look around at what's doing, you know, from a price point of view, because um, members will try anything once. We learn that, <laughs> mm. you know, it's we, we get the feedback straight away. So if it's good bar, we'll bring it back. And if they go, oh, we don't like them, we've still sold them and made a bit of cash, you know. So. Uh, yeah. And I think with the um, with the secondary spend item, a lot of the time it's also just asking if they want a bar. So it's not just a case of putting them up, on, putting a display up, and expecting them to come buy one. It's having a conversation with your members who, every time they visit, and it'll yeah. say as they're getting a drink, like on a bar with that. So it's just that little simple upsell that can really add quite a revenue to your business. I think. The other thing that we've done, which was really useful, which was we we did a high end energy drink bar. So we brought in the standard, you know, drinks from Muscle Finesse, like C4 and Rain and all of that. But then also what we did is, is we brought in like um, the, the um, American brands um, and we actually charged £3.50, you know, which for Grimsby is where I'm based, um, is, is very expensive for an energy drink. And we charged £2 for the others. And people said to me, well, why are you charging £3.50 for Bang Energy? I was like, well, they're American imports. And we actually sell a huge amount of those now. So we have like a kind of high-end energy bar and we also have a low-end one. And that works really well, you know. Nice. Oh, see, I think that's yeah. good if you've got some sort of not exclusives, but just yeah. specials, isn't it, in a way? Things you can't yeah. necessarily get elsewhere. You know, and I often say it's not for everybody, but if you want one, it's there. There's no pressure to have anything where we are. So, you know, yeah. but it just gives people more choice. And hmm. we even do like the canned coffee as well, you know, um, you know, the monster coffee, you know, that that goes slowly, but it does sell. So, uh, nice. you know, yeah. So my is the most, not the most random, but there's a gym, uh, really good friends with a guy called Rob Harris, who's got Progress Gym in Yeovil. And, uh, oh, yeah. He's, he sells, he sells, uh, fresh eggs in a, in the tray, and he sells bill bill tongue and jerky, and he he makes good money from selling eggs to his members. He essentially asks, find, finds out what they want, and he sells it to them. So um, I don't, I'm not saying to every gym to go and buy dozens and dozens of eggs to sell, but uh, if it works, it works. Yeah, I feel yeah. a lot of gyms selling the uh, the liquid egg whites. That's quite a popular yeah. one. Mm. It does, yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely market. Excellent. Excellent. Right. Jumping on to uh, branding, one, I've just got one sort of special suggestion, really. And I think the branded the, the things like T-shirts and jumpers and buddies and that kind of thing all comes down to your member base. I suppose their engagement, but how many members you have as well. If you've got a big club, probably you'll sell more naturally. Um, yeah. But for me, I think when you talk about pre-orders, um, one of the things I've put is almost limited editions. If you've got a bit of traction with your clothing line, you can bring out limited editions of colours and styles or designs where there's only, say, 100 T-shirts available. And I think that can really stimulate interest as well. So, yeah, pre-ordering those or having a small selection, not just, a, a, you know, 500 black T-shirts with your logo on it. So kind of having those quirky designs that people actually start to want. And then you could almost have a, if you get the, the fanatical members where they're buying two or three T-shirts a year because they are sort of selected runs and limited editions. I mean, that's, that's a, a useful... Yeah. I think that's where we 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 went wrong. Um, we just thought because our brand was on a T-shirt, it would sell. But actually, I agree with you. I think you should put a bit bit more into the design um, yeah. and release some limited edition things like that. And that's the feedback we've had as well is that people just want something a bit more creative rather than a T-shirt with our logo on. We actually have someone employed now for 15 hours a week who works purely on graphics for us and wow. social media. You know, and it sounds like a lot of money, but 
believe you me, she, it pays for herself. She's she probably costs I don't know six, seven, eight hundred pound a month. But we knock out. You know, when you're saying you know three t-shirts a year, we've got members who every time I release a hoodie or a t-shirt now go, oh, I'll have one, I'll have one. You know my size, and we are good at the graphics. There's no question about that. But one of the things I would say to you guys as well is just don't underestimate the value of buying in large, not large quantities, but decent quantities from China, because we bring in maybe 100 steel bottles, fully, you know, graphic, really nice finish, you know, properly embossed. We would sell those at maybe 15 to 17 pounds for a bottle and we're only paying six quid delivered. Um, and a lot of people think that you've got to order huge quantities from China, but you don't. And the postage is very negotiable. So we will, you know, we'll argue the toss over. They'll be like, oh, it's four hundred dollars. We'll like, load of rubbish, give you two hundred. It's a very much a market trader system on that Alibaba site, but it is very worth, you know, it's really worth doing. You know, we've recently ordered Fit Nation socks. And they came in at one pound fifty a pair delivered, you know. So even if you're giving them away as a bit of a bundle deal, you know, come and join the gym, have a, a towel, which is actually way more expensive than socks, believe it or not, you know, um, you know, a bottle. Because we've done these so cheaply out there and they're such good quality, the package is about a 70 pound joining package. And in reality, it's costing you maybe 20 quid. But for a contract gym where we're making 600 or five, 600 a year, it's a toss away investment for us, even on the first sign up for the first month, you know? Um, so that's really what I'm looking at, you know, don't see it as that expensive going abroad for those products, you know? Mm. I think with the China thing, I think it's a, it's just having the, take up a punt on that first one, isn't it? Once you get the first one right, you'll be prepared to pay the, the, the yeah. transaction. And I think it's, it's I think your is, it's, it's also, though, having a sort of like 10 or 15 people that when you do a T-shirt design or a, you order a baseball cap, you know, which, I mean, baseball caps are a nightmare. We've just ordered 100 in from China and they're selling really well, which is great. But, you know, we drove them potty over there by going, we want to have a look at the images. And we went around the gym and said, would you buy one? And then we got 25 people who basically said, yeah, yeah, we'll buy these caps. So you've got to put the designs in front of people and go, would you actually wear that? And you'd be surprised how many go, no, I wouldn't. Um, mm. and, and it's getting that feedback. If you're going to do clothing, you need to have a designer going, here's like 12, 15 designs and going around your members going, oh, we're doing this. What do you think? And um, a, it's good because it shows you're investing in what they want. But also, ultimately, you gauge your market for nothing that way, you know. Agreed. And I think with clothing, I think it can be a bit of a or vanity project a lot of the time it's, yeah. uh, as an owner of an operator you love it and you're blinded by the fact that it's your brand but yeah. other people are just gym members and they may not want to so you've got to get that logo it's not just a case of sticking your logo on a black and white t-shirt it's having a bit more creativity with it a bit yeah, yeah, yeah. Style yeah exactly. it. it's, it's, it's hard but yeah no, it's interesting it's interesting well, right that's all my questions i have literally asked everything i don't know if anything else from uk yeah no i'm good it's been really useful and thanks very much really appreciate it no thank you cheers for the question yeah so thank you for hosting again <laughs> no problem yeah, at all. yeah if there's um if there's anyone that is watching this on the replay or anything and you want to have any any more information about what we're doing at the fit club or, or what we're doing at ashbourne just drop me an email uh my email address is toby at ashbourne management .co.uk yeah, thanks, thanks so, so much guys yeah Great stuff. So, right, we'll sign up there. Toby, thank you so much for hosting. Okay, thanks no for jumping in. And we'll, yeah, um, cheers, buddy. if you're on the, uh, the the grenade one in a couple of weeks, maybe we'll see you then. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, cheers. mate. Cheers, guys. Cheers, bye. Bye-bye.